lecture. Uh, today we'll be speaking on protein folding, perhaps the fundamental problem of biology. See. He also told me that this is the very first time he gives this lecture, so it's a world first. Oh, thanks, Marcelo. Uh, yeah, so let me start by indicating uh, quite heuristically this problem of protein folding. I mean, biology is not uh, formula, formalized so much that you can do much, much more than give a heuristic account of the problem. But when uh, we've talked about these amino acid chains, so here's a chain of amino acids, A1, A2, to AN. So we, those of you who've been to my last lecture especially have some, some picture of what I mean by an amino acid chain. Uh, and mathematically, that's uh, really a, a great object because it calls out for mathematics because each of these symbols can be one of a set of 20 letters. So it's just a, such a very clean mathematical object. So what especially I look for in biology are things that have a clean, what I call a clean expression. Okay, and here's something that does not have a clean expression. Uh, that is the folding, the folded protein. So there's a process uh, when this is formed, coming out of a, in the process of uh, replication, one cell dividing into two cells. Uh, so it goes through, uh, first of all, nucleotides, then the, uh, eventually uh, through the genetic code gets uh, processed into a s sequence like this. And before you know it, it's folded. The folded one looks like, if you just take this, this object and wind it around itself in a very confused way, you get the folded protein. This is what I would call not a clean object. You see pictures of these pr proteins and everyone is c completely baffling. So uh, the question is, uh, understand this process of folding. So uh, roughly speaking, think of this as some kind of a biological straight line. They call it maybe a, I don't want to use the word coil too much, but something like this. Here is a representation biologically of the amino acid chain. Here's A1 and so on up to AN. And as a, as, even as it is being made, it starts to fold. So before even it's finished, the first stage is gone into the second. It's going into the second stage. Maybe it'll start folding along here and being uh, produced along here. So the folding is something completely uh, inevitable and natural in the in a body, in the human body, in a biological organism under what they say folding conditions. And that's like body temperature in a good uh, solvent, like the blood. <clears throat> okay, uh, so this is the process of protein folding. And trying to understand this process is, uh, well, it's a big problem. I, you know, I think it's what people say sometimes uh, is being the most important or fundamental problem in biology. To understand this protein folding, it, it could well be the central problem in biology. Anyway, it's an attractive problem to, uh, to try to understand. Okay, uh, and in this connection, I'm attracted to this uh, Anfinson uh, story, Anfinson uh, dogma, they call it. This came out uh, just in the period after the double helix. All these things happened just before and after the discovery of the double helix, especially Pauling and Crick Watson. And Anfinson came out just after that. So he, was, he got the Nobel Prize for this, uh, for this dogma. And he did a lot of uh, evidence, experimental evidence for the dogma, which asserts that the amino acid chain, this simple thing, determines this. So that's the dogma. The, the uh, 
amino acid chain determines the folded state. Sometimes this is called the native state. This is the state that one sees in nature. Okay, so uh, I was attracted by uh, Anfinson's dogma um, quite a little while ago because of the following. We uh, had this successful uh, theory of protein of uh, peptide binding, uh, which uh, seemed uh, you know a lot of people were shocked that we could get such good results only using the amino acid structure, the, the, the amino acid chains. Only using that, we got good results when other people were using all kinds of property, x-ray properties of this, and many, many other things. And here we were doing better just by doing uh, this. But now Ansfensen sort of gives an explanation because it says the information is already here. It's just have to dig the information out. And so the kernel, what I've been talking about, could be interpreted as pulling out a lot of that information that's already here. And Anfinson says there's enough information right in the sequence to determine this full-fledged native or full folded protein. So uh, that's why I like this Anfinson's dogma. It's one of the things I've been trying to do for a while is to understand uh, this more mathematically, give a mathematical structure for this. That's why I want to talk about today is to give some kind of mathematical structures along the way. So here we have something the opposite from a mathematical structure. It's so uh, such a mess, not clean. But what one can do is uh, try to idealize this picture, which is enough to give uh, the properties and the character of this. So we want to find a idealized version of the folded protein. Now, uh, something that's important in all our studies, and I'm speaking PDB, protein database. So a lot of the, uh, everything I do is done in my group that I put together, this group studying immunology originally, and now immunology and proteins. This is a great object. Protein database, the super reference for so many questions of uh, biology, of uh, genes and sequences and structures. They, they deal with the structure. They have a, there's about 100,000 elements in here, 100,000 proteins. And each of them, uh, it's a great thing because they have so many reference for each of the 100,000 and so many ways of looking at it. In particular, they give the amino acid uh, sequence. And what, for this, what do they give for this? <laughs> they give something very exact. They give the position of each of these, uh, say, 10,000 atoms in space. They give, they give uh, you know, coordinates for uh, 10,000 atoms here. Uh, and they give uh, you know, the distances between them, everything. Uh, of course, the coordinates gives the distances, but they give a picture completely of this folded protein. But this is sometimes one understands as the, uh, you know, the overabundance of data. Here we have a vast amount of data even for a single protein, but it doesn't allow one to understand anything. And they, you, know, you see so many discussions of data these days where you have all this data, but there's no meaning. So this is a good example of knowing the exact position of every atom. That's a huge amount of data, but no understanding. The Steve, what you call atom is some kind of uh, biological molecule. What's that? Atom? Yes. Atom. No, that atom is just an atom. Real atom? A real atom, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. An ordinary atom. There's about 10,000 atoms here. Yeah, we'll see it in more detail. I'm going to give a more atomic picture as we proceed. Because it is very close to life. What's life then? <laughs> okay, I don't... It could be a dead body. <laughs> yeah, I don't have an answer to what is life yet. <laughs> okay. But I will give a picture of some of the atomic aspects of this. Then I think you have a new dogma of your... Of your, of your <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, uh, I can recommend this PD base. It's very user friendly. But this is the uh, the outcome for the 3D structure. Is a complete uh, picture of all the atoms, the positions in three dimensional space. Okay. Uh, so let me uh, proceed to give you know, re, sort of uh, un, undo this a little bit, so we get a more mathematical picture of some idealization. Okay. So let me. In the meantime, give it an atomic picture associated to this. So here we have an amino acid chain. What is the atomic version of this? I'm going to give it right now something called the backbone structure. Of A belonging to, let's call it script A. So here we have the set of amino acids, amino acid chains. Here we have an amino acid chain, and now I want to extract some uh, geometric structure of that amino acid chain, and I'm going to neglect less important things in my estimation. Uh, in other people's estimation too, probably. So here is the, here it is. Uh, I'm gonna, so these are the atoms. Okay, so we start with a, a nitrogen atom, then we come to a carbon atom, we call it alpha carbon, the first one, and then we get a uh, another carbon atom, and over here we have. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not too good at these things because I just learned them very recently. Here we have a radical R1, or this could be a an amino acid, or the, or the substance of the amino acid branching off from C alpha. Here we have a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom is a little special because it's so light that it's not found in the uh, X-ray crystallography. So that sometimes it doesn't, one, one doesn't see this in the PDB list, but it's there. And then we have another uh, hydrogen atom. Up here we have a pair of oxygen atoms. And this corresponds to uh, A1. So the A1 consists of these three elements of a, a backbone. This is A1. The first amino acid is really more in the uh, molecular structure corresponding to the chain. Looks something like this, where R1 is the main part of A1. And then we repeat this. So here we go to N again. This is a bond. These are bond. These lines are all bonds, and we repeat this. So again, we get C alpha, and then this is called sometimes carbonyl. It's a carbon atom. Okay. And again, we have this O2 and R2. This is the substance of the second amino acid. H bond. H bond. Yeah, I think. Uh, see, I'm uh, still a little unfamiliar with all this, but that's this is the basic idea. It goes on up to the end. Here's the nth stage, A n, and this is A two. So what I've drawn is a uh, some kind of a, a molecular version of the amino acid chain. And it's, you know, some things it neglects a lot. This R1 contains a lot of information. Uh, this is the backbone, backbone structure. Okay. Now, uh, this backbone structure, I think, is the main structure of the folded uh, amino acid chain. Uh, here's a paper. I mean, it's, this is a, a very fine paper. I try to read all the time. It's called a backbone based theory of protein folding. This is seven years ago. So they see this is the main object in the folding process. And these uh, side chains, these are called ch side chains, they play a secondary role. Okay, so this is uh, probably the main uh, thinking of a biologist today is the importance of the backbone structure. That's not, you know, a lot of 
biologists disagree, but most, I would say, uh, think this is the, the main structure in the folding process, or the understanding is this backbone structure. Okay, now we're, again, putting things into a mathematical setting, like we like to do, because we can now... See, this is cyclic. It repeats itself. So we can start to extract very not neat, simple objects here. And that's why I want to do is start extracting neat, simple objects so we get something almost as good as a, an amino acid structure which idealizes, over-idealizes the folded protein. That's the idea. Okay, so... And then this gets very mathematical, very geometrical. Uh, so the biology says that these atoms all lie in the same plane. There's four basic atoms here. Uh, this, 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 and this. So four atoms don't necessarily, don't usually belong to a plane, but uh, they do in this case, essentially. So this is a planar from the biology. And the same over here. So these are these have to do with the binding of two amino acids in the chain. They're bound with these standard ways of carbon uh, atoms and uh, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. They're all bound in this chain in the same way. Uh, same way. Here's the the binding. Okay. So what is important now is uh, these relations here. And so these are on a plane. This atom is not in the plane. This atom falls out of the plane. So we can have an angle, phi here. we we'll call it phi 1, associated to the first element. So there's uh, a lot of different names. Dihedral angle, uh, torsion angle is phi 1. You watch the orientations, certainly. And uh, or sometimes you call them Ramchandran angles. So there are all these different names for phi 1. And then one, so this takes us out of this plane. All this is in 3 space. And now this, this atom doesn't lie uh, is in 3 space, but we take the uh, plane of this. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, so we get a new plane by taking this, this here intersected with this. So uh, Take the vector here, from here to here and cut a plane through here uh, to get a new angle. That's C1. So it's a very good geometrical construction. I know that it exists, and I know its properties, but I can't, can't be too handy with it. But it's there. And so one gets, in this way, a sequence of angles, phi1, phi1, C1, C2, C2, uh, up to the nth time, or n minus 1, C1, Cn, let's say. Okay, so these are the sequence of angles uh, that come out of now this. This is now getting into the three-dimensional structure. So these are associated to the three-dimensional structure of the protein, of the native protein of the uh, folded protein. And here, uh, this is, doesn't have any folding. So this is, uh, of course, in here, but here is this. You can see the way I describe it. There's a three-dimensional aspect to it. OK, so what uh, I want to do is to, uh, here we have phi and C. I want to look at A1, A2, I don't know. Know exactly how to worry about the uh, final picture, final uh, one here. I guess it's okay, but we have a new chain described this way. So this gives us a new chain. 
a, a chain which begins to give us some of the uh, three-dimensional aspects of the protein. It's a chain with these objects. Okay, so this is uh, the beginning of uh, what I would call a, a main description here. Uh, let me uh, look at a little bit of the big picture. So, uh, in the in the uh, database, I want to make a big space. In our ba- database, we, we'll be looking at PDB or subsets of PDB, but it's a very unnatural condition to say they should all have the same length. Having the same length is not a natural condition on proteins. So what we'll do is look at the following picture. Here we'll take uh, space A down here, and here we'll take the space S of dihedral angles, space S of dihedral angle sequences. Okay, so this is one axis and here's the other axis. I look at the subset of uh, of A cross S. I want to look at the subset. uh, I'll call it... uh, Let's see, what is the best notation? Maybe I'll call it E, contained in here. It's defined by length of a, uh, call these sequences S. S will stand for a dihedral angle sequence such that it's defined by the condition that the length of S equals the length of A, amino acid sequence. So here we have an A, here we have an S. If they have the same sequence, this pair will be in the space E. So that allows us to work with sequences uh, of the same length because we always want, eventually want to consider these paired with an amino acid sequence. We're going to look at the pair. And this, I don't think, this approach has not, that we found, we haven't found this approach in the literature. And now we have a projection of this onto A, restrict it to here to get some kind of fibering. So this is a fibering. So it means over, for example, A1, we have all potential C1, C1s. Over A2, we have another big family of these. Okay, so this is the uh, a main object we'll be studying. So in here, our sequences of dihedral angles are associated to an amino acid sequence. And we want to pre- preserve that. We want to keep the association of that dihedral angle sequence always with a particular amino acid sequence. They just don't fly around uh, independent of that. For example, in this space, uh, we have a, 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 fold, a, a folded element uh, in here corresponding to the amino acid. It's according to Anthonson's uh, dogma or according also to the PDB, we get this. And that is a a cross-section, which will take to an amino acid sequence, it will take its folded uh, structure, its native structure, in terms of dihedral angles. Okay, so this is okay for dihedral angles, but what uh, what are dihedral angles? Well, here is one thing uh, that some of you geometrically inclined people can see pretty quickly. I don't see quite so fast. If we know this, and we know another couple of things here, uh, a bond in between with the, uh, with an angle here, and uh, the length of the bond, then we can 
reconstruct the backbone. So, uh, you know, there's a few technical things here, but you can reconstruct backbone from the dihedral angles S and B pair A S. So that is a reconstruction. So it means that the dihedral angles are giving us all this. So that's giving us quite a lot. Okay, and the that uh, I ask, uh, well, maybe I should mention some of the people here. Any questions? Yeah, here, uh, last time I mentioned uh, Wen Jun Shen and uh, Chin uh, Guo, who worked with us on the first paper. They're still working hard with us. And she is an gra advanced graduate student. He is a postdoc working for me, Chin. And also now, uh, here's a person who's joined us in the last six months, Shuai Chang Li. And also Yu Ting Wei. Okay, so uh, these are the ones uh, who have been working, uh, especially Chang. On uh, this problems, on these problems of uh, getting this picture good, because he has a lot of experience in proteins. Uh, Shuai is a uh, assistant professor at City University uh, in the computer science department, with a lot of uh, papers on experience on proteins. Uh, Yu Ting uh, is a uh, stu undergraduate student at Peking University. And she came to work for, for this last August and September in Hong Kong, and she did a lot of good work, good computations connected with the things I'm talking about today. And besides uh, those two and the first ones I mentioned, we have uh, four new postdocs who started working, already all of them making reports, and uh, those are uh, Zhen Zhen Zheng, she was three years a postdoc in Irvine, uh, University of California. And uh, CC, uh, CC Cheng, she's uh, from Hong Kong, just got her doctor's degree. And Diego Amantano just got his PhD, came to work with me just a few weeks ago. He's from uh, Montevideo. And Santiago Lapine, he's uh, from Buenos Aires just came again a couple months ago. So all these people are working in our, in our group, and they're all very good at, everybody I mentioned is very, very good at computational uh, work. Yeah? Do I understand correctly that do the angles depend, they're allowed to depend on the whole sequence? Or do they only depend on the... It's local. Oh, it's all, that's local, yeah. See, it, it, yeah, this description I gave, it depends just on uh, the neighboring planes. Just on the neighboring Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's all local. Okay. So, uh, why is the angle, what's that? Why, why is the angle of 5N? Why, why don't they, why aren't they of 5N? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I just was wondering that now as I write it down. If, yeah, you could say it goes up to like N minus 1. It may be right. I'm not sure how to deal with the last one. No, well, uh, well, it's hard to what does that mean? But uh, certainly the 3D structure uh, implies all the angles. Yeah, that's right. More questions? Okay, uh, so I mentioned Shuai now uh, because what he did was to write out. I asked him to do this, and he wrote out just three pages. Uh, and a note to me, uh, you know, he's not a mathematician, but he wrote out very clearly the complete proof and construction of this passage from the angles to the, uh, to the backbone. So that's all mathematical, no, no computation. 
It's math mathematical formulae. He did everything very painstakingly with a three-dimensional uh, analytic geometry, so to speak. He, he uh, proved that you could get this derived from the angles, and he was assuming in that derivation that you knew the bonding angles here, too, and bonding lengths. But now here's something that we want to do. There is, that, because of that, there is some ambiguity, other information in these bonds between these, these residues. And so what we can do, and what we do do, is we use idealized dihedral angle sequences. You can idealize them uh, in such a way that all these angles are constant. Because these angles don't vary very much, but they do confuse the picture. So we do a technical trick by uh, modifying the angle sequence to, uh, somewhat, a little bit, to get constant angles here. So then this, this becomes a very clean picture. There's no more bonding angles, bonding lengths coming into the picture. That's all constant. They're all, you just take those as the averages, the means, and then we just have these phi, phi I, CIs. Okay, so that's just kind of a technical trick just to make everything very smooth and simple. So we're finally getting a description here of just, just these, a chain of these objects. Okay? Okay, so uh, you may have noticed that this is a finite set of AI, and these, phi1, c1, they define an element of the two-dimensional torus. So we have to be careful. Now we're working with a non-traditional alphabet, the alphabet with real uh, values in uh, torus. Okay, that's okay. We can do that, and we do we do that. All right. So uh, we're getting more and more of a picture of our space E here, and we can see now that E is uh, stronger than it looks. It gives you this complete backbone structure. The backbone doesn't tell us what the R1s, R2 are, but if we look at the pairs, see that's going to give us uh, pretty much the uh, amino acids too. So we're getting, uh, by combining those two objects, we're getting more and more of a picture here. So these are not exactly the positions of R1, but we know what uh, amino acid that corresponds to. So uh, getting way ahead of where we are, we eventually could take something like the center of mass of this whole side chain. We've got a little more refined picture. Okay, so uh, for the moment, we have this space. Okay, any questions on, on that space? It's kind of a fiber bundle structured over our original space A that we studied in the last lecture. What's that? A mind plane, skip tight planes. You are you are in the midst of the world. I don't know if that's there for a base because you are in the midst of these planes. Uh-huh. Okay. You have just two you have just just two sequences of the of the of of animals. At first there are there are three sequences, but 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 you have just two because you introduce the mind planes. But uh, I don't know if the perturbation of these planes would be necessary for <laughs> an approach to the... I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, part of what we're doing is kind of classical and well-studied here. I mean, the backbone, certainly we don't introduce the backbone. What I, we do introduce is this new space of pairs. So a lot of this is traditional bioinformatics and protein studies. Okay, uh, so next thing, let me just say what I'm going to do here. I want to define a kernel, K on A. That's a kernel we have from before. K3 hat is on the space of amino acid chains. I want to use that kernel very much in this picture. And I want to define a new kernel, S structural kernel, on uh, S. 
on the dihedral angle chain. I want to def define this now. And if I do that, then I'll take the product of these two kernels. That'll be a kernel on this product space, tensor product. And then I'll restrict that to this space. Now I'll get a kernel on this space. So this is going to define a kernel. We'll define a kernel. Reproduce, well, these are positive definite matrices on a <coughs> kernel. Let's call it a K hat 3 cross S hat 3 on A cross A and restrict. The restriction of a kernel is a kernel. Restrict. To E, script E, to get a kernel, a kernel, we'll call, just call it K, because that's going to be our, our key kernel. This is, called, this is our key space we're studying, and K will be our uh, main kernel on it. So this is a sketch of what how things proceed from here. And so now we have a kernel on the space E. We have a geometry on this space of, uh, you might say, idealized proteins. So E, script E, you can think of as a space of ideal proteins. Which, uh, from what I said, we can see it's all already uh, containing a lot of the information of the proteins. Now here is something else. Uh, I asked Shuai, Shuai is a great computing with proteins, uh, I asked him to do the following. I, there's something called a secondary structure here, which uh, I don't know if I'll have time to talk about it too much today. It's somewhere between the full 3D structure and the amino acid structure. It's called a secondary structure. It's partway there. So a, a big problem towards understanding the three-dimensional structure is to understand the secondary structure. Okay, so secondary structure intervenes, and so I suggested that uh, Shuai, uh, starting from here, predict the secondary structure. So from here, there's enough information here, in other words, uh, with this kernel, using this kernel, to get the uh, secondary structure. Okay, so he, he put an experiment, uh, you know, took a I don't know, a week or so to run the machine on this problem. And uh, he came out with 2% uh, uh, loss of accuracy for get getting the secondary structures on here from this information. Uh, he took a database from PDB of about 3,000 representative proteins. And on that, he got within 2%. Now, 2% is pretty close to the, is the limits of accuracy of anything in here. So uh, as far as that knows, as far as that goes, this means one can reconstruct the secondary structures already from this information. That's, I think it's pretty powerful evidence that this is a, a very, uh, has a lot of information here. And this is clean. You see the description I gave here is very clean, except I haven't defined the kernel here. But this is what I call a clean object. Okay, uh, so a uh, well, few questions hanging, but maybe the most important is to define this kernel here. This is going to be a kernel on the dihedral angle space. And I'm going to do it, uh, well, there's two ways of doing this. One is I just... Some of these things I've just been thinking about since I arrived in Rio. Some of these questions that I'm talking about uh, today. Uh, some we've been talking about for quite a while in Hong Kong. But let me, uh, I think I, admit, I uh, skipped this. When I talked about K1 from Blossom 62-2, 
there's one step I, I don't think I even mentioned. It's carried out in detail in our paper, uh, but I don't think I mentioned that. So let me say what that is, because that becomes very important for the construction of this uh, S3, S hat 3. And that is K1, we start with Q of XY. This is a kernel on the set of amino acids. Amino acids, this is 20 elements. 20 by 20 matrix can be uh, thought of as a 20 by 20 matrix. And this Q of XY, I mentioned maybe vaguely, this is the raw data for Blossom 62, which we had to go back in the literature pretty far to find an expression for Q of XY. That's a positive adjustment matrix in the basic part of Blossom 62. Once we have Q, then what we do, well, we define, uh, we call it P, but it's a marginal probability. This is equal to the integral uh, Q XY. I use integral for sum. I don't know why. Sum over Y, this is like the row sum. And so uh, V of X is just the row sum for matrices. And, or you can think of it, if this is a measure on the product as it was, with the norm, it can always be normalized by, just by dividing it by a constant. So uh, if this is a measure, this would be the marginal measure. Okay, then we form, I forget if I said much about this, we form Q of XY divided by D of X D of Y. And this is, if we take this to the beta power, this is uh, our K1. This is a kernel on one element uh, strings for the first part, for the talk yesterday. Okay, so there is some special thing going here. Is this uh, bringing in some kind of measure? Because this is a, like a marginal measure. Okay, so here it's not too, not too big a deal, but that was part of our construction of K1 and hence K3 here. And now it, this becomes much more interesting. Oh, let's see. Uh, okay, I'll... So I want to define a kernel on uh, just the uh, uh, one, one element chain. So I want to define S1. So S1 of is a kernel on the torus, X, Y. Or you could say... Uh, So it's going to be on C1, C1, comma, C2, C2. A kernel, remember, is a function of the product space. Here, uh, the torus is the basic space for these variables. So it's a product of the torus times itself. Okay, so a kernel is a function of the torus times itself. And what we do here, uh, so this is going to be a function of all these. And this, this is kind of a naive tensor product here. I'm going to write it uh, over with oversimplification. So it's going to be a cosine of this difference. In the, have to divide by 2. We have to be sure that they're in a good range. So the, the phi i's are angles, so we take them from minus pi to pi. That's right, minus pi to pi. And then we write this, cosine. Uh, we have to be careful what we mean by taking these differences. They fall outside their range, so we have to pay a little attention to that. And then we put cosine uh, psi 1 minus psi 2. Okay, so this is uh, pretty uh, natural. 
uh, because what we're doing is we're saying kernels are close, uh, of two elements is close to one, provided uh, the angles, phi one and phi two are close. See, phi one equals phi two, this is cosine of zero, and the same over here. So this is just a kind of a natural distance construction for S1. Now we're not working anymore with finite, uh, finite alphabet. So everything goes through and, and these, for these uh, objects, chains of elements in the real numbers or circles, we go through, it goes through with this kernel. So this defines a kernel. And, uh, so this is, I, I should say, slightly loose. Not, not too bad. You just have to pay attention uh, to the uh, ranges of the angles. And in that range, then the cosine behaves pretty good. All right? So that's a, uh, this is a kernel then. This defines a kernel on the torus product with itself. Okay, good. Now, uh, we want to look at something. So that gives us something like the Q here. This gives us like something like the Q. And now we want something like the D of X. And so we want something like this. And now we bring in a, something a little more complicated, but has a lot of power. We did it at first just naively without taking this measure into account. But now we take the measure into account. And so this gives us something very big in the history of uh, the subject. Rama Chandran. Rama Chandran plots. Because these angles, phi and psi, these pairs, uh, they're not, they have uh, restrictions on them. They're not arbitrary. They have a lot to do with uh, various things. So a Ramachandran plot is something of this type. It's uh, phi down here, C here, and we have some dots here of the uh, ones, places where one sees the angles. That's a Ramachandran plot. And there are lots of these regions which nothing happens. You don't have any elements. So this is important to put into uh, this structure D of X into our kernel. It's because here we use a, a, met a metric a measure, and uh, this is a natural measure to use. So what we do, uh, what Yu Ting did, uh, was to uh, use the constructed distribution here from statistics mixed Gaussian. So she used uh, a function on here, real value function, uh, coming from this over all amino acids. These are all amino acids, all 20 amino acids, and uh, lots of uh, places to look through where you would find these angles, so there's a you know, over big databases of proteins. So this is in the literature, uh, these plots going back to Ramachandran, and that goes back to uh, the same time as, uh, you know, as our, uh, that time of the double helix and so on. So he almost got the Nobel Prize, they say, for, for introducing these plots. They have so much, so much significance in the protein structure. So now we construct this distribution corresponding to this. Okay, then we define, using that distribution, we use the same construction here, where Q is replaced by this S. That's the idea. Okay, maybe, yes. Uh, okay, so I just have been wondering about it for a while, and I think it makes sense. I, you can do this, thinking of uh, this picture, A, phi 1, C1, and here, A1. And I think uh, it's okay now 
to use this Ramachandran plot for just a single amino acid, which gives it a lot more uh, you know, sharpness. If you do this for a single amino acid, a single A, then you get a, something with more information if it can be used. And I think one can do that now just by uh, using the for formulas for D of X, then you have, uh, say, B1, phi, uh, we'll say, uh, B, B1, phi1 prime, C1 prime. So you have these two pairs, and you want to define a kernel on these two pairs, and you can, I think, reconstruct this by the same idea, except we don't have to look at these over all the uh, these uh, plots from Raman Chadran over all of the uh, amino acids, but you do it for each amino acid separately, the ones that come in here. And then you just use the same integral formula to obtain this D of X, and that will give us a better, sharper kernel on here. Okay, uh, so once we have that, then that gives us quite a bit. So now uh, we can define a map from A, the amino acid chains, it's going to be a cross section into E. This is going to take an amino acid chain uh, into uh, the native structure. See, among all these angles corresponding to a point a amino acid chain here, there's going to be one which is the native structure, the folded structure. That's a unique one. So that's the native, the native structure, and that defines this cross section. Now that can be done on several levels. You can do it <clears throat> as follows. You can take uh, the point of view, take the ground truth. This is defined as something we don't know at all, we'll never know it, but there is a ground truth here which gives us to each amino acid a corresponding element here, according to Anthonson. And a lot of these things will work maybe for most proteins, and so the question is to a great extent, choose our protein uh, database to, uh, and see what happens with this picture. So here's a native structure, it defines a cross section. Okay, now we can also take data for this. So the protein database uh, gives data for the, uh, for the native structure. In uh, lots of respect, lots of situations, it gives sharp data. Other times, the data gets pretty bad. So one can uh, <coughs> take out a lot of the best data to get a data-driven data version of this. Okay. And now, uh, one can say, let's look at the characteristic function of the image of this. So here we have E containing, say, E native, given by the, uh, the ground truth. And now we take the characteristic function, chi of uh, E native, a function from E into the real numbers. OK, what one would like to do for many, many purposes is to uh, really understand this map. This is the Anfinson map. We'd like to really understand that. And now we have uh, the ground truth is a section here of this, in this bundle. We want to approximate this function from the data. Okay, so now if you uh, remember our, the last lecture, once we have a kernel on the space, here we do have this kernel K I described. Once we have a kernel on the space, then we can use regularized least squares to make such approximations. So we want to approximate this characteristic function. And that will go from data uh, to a, uh, for one thing, to new data, the data that uh, is very poor data in the PDB, and get a prediction for that. 
and uh, it's a whole slew of things if this uh, program works out. This is uh, uh, you know, very uh, new, so you have to take everything I say with a big grain of salt. I just sent an email to the people in the immunology group to try this uh, regularized least squares with the data from PDB for some maybe smaller data set to this problem of uh, estimating uh, the native structure. Anyway, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Are there are questions. Yeah. Please, please wait for the microphone so that the question can be recorded. Do you actually have some uh, experimental data if this idea works? <laughs> no, no, oh, no. This protein <laughs> far from that. Here, here's something that maybe a little bit like that. Uh, <clears throat> What we did was to take a smaller uh, database for this model of about 150 uh, proteins, uh, which were uh, from the alpha, <coughs> the alpha chain part of the S scope, SCOP. Uh, they were simpler because they're, the only com complexity comes from the alpha helixes, if you know what they are, secondary structures. So they're simpler, somewhat simpler, but they're you know, this is a big class of proteins. And we asked uh, this problem. Find the Lipschitz a constant uh, uniformly or better in, say, an L2 measure of the Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant for, uh, for this map here. So let's see. Uh, let me, yeah, you can measure the Lipschitz constant in different ways. And uh, it turned out that this Lipschitz constant from here to here, from the data, of the, this was, uh, she got, I think, 1.4 for the Lipschitz constant, which is pretty good, which just says there's a lot of stability in that case, the special case of alpha chains. So the Lipschitz constant is able to measure the stability. See, Anfinson originally conjectured... Uh, not only the, uh, the, you know, the dogma, as I stated it here, but he said there is going to be a stability of this uh, correspondence. He, he said that explicitly. He didn't, of course, he didn't have the mathematical formalism, but he conjectured there was a stable situation. And we found in this situation it was stable. Uh, but <clears throat> here is an amusing story. We thought we had a counterexample to Anfinson. Uh, by, use, by looking at this, using actually Yu Ting's uh, data, it looked like a counterexample because we had two amino acid chains that differed by only one uh, element in the chain. One amino acid was changed, and the uh, corresponding structure up here annihilated a whole uh, dozen uh, elements of a uh, alpha helix, part of the secondary structure. So in the secondary structure, it looked like this was the big counterexample to Anfinson. Okay, so we looked into that quite a bit, and we found out that that was an uh, artificial protein because the protein database contains a third of the elements uh, are artificial proteins. So I think uh, we can exclude the artificial proteins. They aren't, they're not so natural. <laughs> Anyway, that was a little story of uh, where you don't have stability in any reasonable sense. More questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, just uh, related to the stability, I mean, the dogma of uh, uh, there is an assumption, and I had an assumption that there exists for any chain, there exists a structure, a 3D structure. So it's not clear that uh, this function is well defined, that there exists. <laughs> no, is it clear from the mathematical point of view that? Uh, oh, uh, nothing's too clear like that. But what, what, yeah, what is, so from the PDB uh, base, if you start with uh, some set of this, and especially if it's a very uh, not pathological set, so the sequences aren't too long, uh, and some other you know, reasonable hypotheses, uh, 
Then you can associate, according to the PDB base, you get an amino acid chain. And you can also get a uh, uh, dihedral angle chain, phi C. So uh, this, correspond this map is pretty much one-to-one, -one, and then you get an induced map here. So uh, there is this picture, which is largely true from, uh, well, just from our experiments in, in general. So the PDB, if you start with this, you get both the amino acid chain and the dihedral angle chain. This, this takes some work, but we did that. And then we would get this, this map which is generally well-defined because there isn't too much ambiguity here. And if there is, we could just work with <coughs> the, the sets here, which have unique uh, inverses. The point is that the structure, there are inevitable fluctuations in the structure. So these angles also should uh, fluctuate a little bit. They should oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, so there is a, a little bit of oscillation in the angle, so... Yeah, there is some kind of a <laughs> noise here. And, you know, worse than that, the PDB is taking uh, inputs from many different labs, and those different labs all have <laughs> little different numbers too. So there is a, a lot of questions uh, and ambiguities, and yeah. When you pass from one structure to another. You use statistical methods or some other methods as well. What, what kind of methods do you use to? Oh, just the one I wrote on the board. Uh. I mean, there is some statistics in here, sure. But uh, yeah, these are the uh, everything is right. Uh, what you see. I mean, these car these kernels have a kind of a statistics uh, interpretation. Yeah, you can interpret them as in terms of random walks. Uh, yeah, but the things are right there. Uh, so you, you, it's kind of analytic techniques. You, you somehow integrate. Well, I, want, I don't know what you call this. What I wrote on the board is that analytic or geometrical uh, or statistical. I don't. Know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what you see is what maybe, we're doing. May, maybe I'm slow, but it's not enough for me information uh -huh. to. Oh no! I just, <laughs> to, well, to get I, uh, yeah, I said a lot of hard things, and uh, I didn't give you all. But you know, these things are all there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, first, uh, first, uh, thank you for the lecture. I'm sorry I was late, so I couldn't see everything. But um, when you explain the distribution of the C's and the fees, you, what kind of, of uh, distribution do you see? It's like a normal distribution in this region. It's, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so what we do is... Uh, and I, uh, or did this. uniform on this uh, kind of hyperbola, you just... Drew. Yeah, no, so that was pretty straightforward statistics. What she did was to take a sum of Gaussians. Each Gaussian is normal. And she, takes, she took a sum of maybe 25 or so Gaussians, except it was all reformulated because they were not on the Euclidean space, they were in uh, angle space. So this is called von, uh, von der Mises or von Mises. Uh, distributions. Uh, they're Gaussians on angle spaces, and you're taking a sum of, of a couple dozen, and then fitting the parameters by, a, you know, just long by, process. Just by data retrieving. You. Uh, the fitting the parameters. Well, yeah, use yeah. a lot of data. Uh, another question is, uh, why did you keep uh, drawing an hyperbola for the distribution of the fees and the psi's? It's like when you, you, you set oh, here? the... You mean this? Yeah, yeah. That's not when a hyperbola. When you set the, the points, you... <laughs> no. No, it's just that when you, when you drew it, you made the points in this kind of fashion, and instinctively, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. But. Yeah, but uh, you can see, I don't even know if I have one here, but everywhere, kind of, uh, everywhere you see pictures of this distribution. Here's some in... Uh, Here's, here's one, for example, a report of Yuting. See this picture here? Can you see that from there? <laughs> That's <Yeah>. a picture. <laughs> so I was just drawing something to indicate. Uh, okay. that you see, uh, this is a picture of the Ramachandran plot here. Put it near, near the okay, put it here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And there's a backbone, too. <laughs> 
just to summarize. Yeah. These kind of patterns, there are particular geometries, lo- loci, uh, uh, they have a geometric structure where it's like completely random, the number of Oh, no, no, this, this picture's like not that. random. It's highly uh, no, it's I, bio- I, I, biological I, structure. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, wondering about the, the actual deviance between two different samples, but they are kind of close when you see the, the angles, right? Yeah. Uh, the variation, uh, what could it do about, I don't know, the topology of oh, those Oh, there's a points, huge, uh, huge amount of studies of these angles, uh, uh, you know, what they're likely to be, uh, restrained regions. And in, in, uh, if you assume certain part aspects of the uh, protein, they'll have a certain special order. If you look at the secondary uh, you know, alpha helix, then they, they tend to be constant for a little while. So it's, you know, I don't know if people found all the right answers there, but certainly they've studied uh, those dihedral angles a, a lot, a lot, because they're so uh, important in understanding proteins. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Steve again for this series of lectures. Steve will be speaking again on Monday uh, at the beginning.